on World News Tonight. Climate Talks World's two biggest greenhouse gas emitters, USA and China, enter into climate talks as the planet reels under extreme weather. Nuclear allies South Korea and USA set to formulate a new nuclear deal to quell the aggression opposed by North Korea. Seized partnerships Russia and the UN brokered grain deal shortly after Ukraine launches attack against the Crimean Bridge. And Pets Go Gourmet. Pet-friendly eatery in Shanghai serves our furry friends with gourmet meals. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and you are watching the World News. And we start off tonight with the updates on the extreme weather that's taking up the world by storm. As John Kerry, the United States' envoy on climate, has held talks with China's top diplomat in J Beijing, calling for cooperation to tackle global warming and to redefine the troubled diplomatic relations between the world's two biggest greenhouse gas emitters. The planet is reeling under extreme weather. Global temperatures are soaring to historic highs and torrential rain has swamped cities. On Monday, the world's two biggest carbon emitters, the United States and China, sought to reignite talks on climate change, with US climate envoy John Kerry urging both sides to cut methane emissions and coal-fired power. That as forest fires raged in Europe, ahead of a second heat wave, which could see the continent break its highest recorded temperature of 119.8 Fahrenheit, possibly on the Italian island of Sardinia. Across Turkey, firefighters continued to battle with blazes for a second day on Monday. Water was dropped from the air to try to quell flames which had already forced three villages to evacuate. It was a similar story for Spain's La Palma, with over 300 firefighters working to contain a raging forest fire. 4,000 people on the Spanish island were forced to evacuate from surrounding villages and authorities said the conditions were far from being stabilised. For Asia, it was torrential rain. In South Korea, dozens of people were left dead as river levees collapsed, causing flash floods. And search efforts continued on Monday as authorities walked through thick mud in search of further victims. India's New Delhi remained waterlogged days after the Yamuna River overflowed into the city. It rose to its highest level in 45 years last week. According to the government, Thousands of people were evacuated to relief camps to escape the flooding. And Typhoon Talim was gaining strength due to make land at night along China's southern coast, forcing the cancellation of flights and trains. Over in the US, nearly a quarter of the population fell under extreme heat advisories. California's Death Valley officially recorded 133 Fahrenheit on Sunday, that's just one degree away from the hottest recorded temperature on Earth, according to the World Meteorological Organization. Scientists say the target of keeping global warming within 1.5 degrees Celsius of pre-industrial levels is moving beyond reach, with evidence of the crisis everywhere. And the World Health Organization chief urged world leaders to act, tweeting that the climate crisis is happening. Over in South Korea now, officials reported confirmed that at least 50 people have been killed or remain missing amidst the latest torrential rain in the nation. And authorities have launched a probe into the tragic underpass flooding in Osong. Torrential rainfall during this year's monsoon season has resulted in lost lives and damage to infrastructure. According to the latest data from the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters, as of 11 a.m. Tuesday, nationwide, 41 people have died and nine are still missing as a result of the recent weather. In addition, 35 people have been injured while over 12,000 have evacuated their homes for safety and the monsoon season is not over yet. Another body, presumed to be that of a missing person, was found in a river in Yecheonggun County, Gyeongsangbukdo Province, where a large-scale landslide occurred due to heavy rain. Authorities are currently verifying the identity of that person. The latest victim not yet been added to the official death toll from the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters, but the number of deaths in Yecheonggun County has now increased to 10, with 7 still missing. 
At the site of the flooded underpass in Usong in Cheongju City, Chungcheongbukdo Province, one more body was recovered, bringing the death toll from that flash flood event rising to at least 14 at 8:10 p.m. on Monday. Search and rescue efforts inside the tunnel came to an end on Monday night. However, considering that the most recently recovered body was found in a grassy area near the tunnel, the authorities plan to continue the search outside the tunnels, such as along riverbank and in fields. The Office for Government Policy Coordination announced on Monday that they have started an investigation to determine the cause of the tragic incident in Usung. Authorities confirmed that one to two hours before the tragedy took place, there were two emergency calls to 112 requesting the emergency evacuation of residents and emergency control of the underground tunnel. Landslides have also been a cause for concern during this monsoon season. Nationwide, 195 landslides were reported between July 6 and July 17, mainly in Chungcheongnam-do, Jeollabuk-do, and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces. More on South Korea now with Seoul and Washington holding their first meeting on a nuclear dialogue channel to bolster the allies' deterrence against North Korea's growing nuclear and missile capabilities. The two governments' commitment to extend deterrence against North Korea continues to take shape with their first session of the nuclear consultative group set to take place in Seoul. South Korea and the United States are launching their bilateral dialogue platform to coordinate nuclear responses to North Korea's growing security threat. On Tuesday, President Yoon Suk-yeol spoke at the inaugural meeting of the Nuclear Consultative Group in Seoul, with the first quarterly session to address information sharing, consultation mechanisms, joint planning and execution of nuclear deterrence against North Korea. The NCG was formed as part of Presidents Yoon and Joe Biden's Washington Declaration in April, after North Korea launched an unprecedented number of missile tests last year, and experts warned that a seventh nuclear test could be imminent. Amid growing concern over the North's fast-evolving capabilities, and with recent public opinion surveys finding over 70% feel the need for South Korea to develop its own nuclear weapons, Seoul and Washington agreed in April to bolster their joint capabilities and confidence in executing the U.S. extended deterrence policy of defending allies who fall under conventional or nuclear attack. While Seoul does not have nuclear weapons, the NCG would allow its participation in Washington's nuclear planning and operating process, differentiating the group from other dialogue bodies such as the Extended Deterrence Strategy and Consultation Group. This could help reduce strategic gaps and response time in nuclear crises, bolstering credibility and cohesiveness between the two allies. While critics say the NCG falls short of nuclear sharing or shared control of US assets, such as under NATO's own arrangement with Washington, others deem it an important window into Washington's planning and decision-making. On that note, a senior presidential official in Seoul told reporters that South Korea's involvement in NATO's military intel sharing system called BICES could provide crucial insights into its own exchange and use of information with the United States. Underscoring its importance, the NCG talks have been upgraded to the level of vice ministers, with Principal Deputy National Security Advisor Kim Tae-ho and White House Indo-Pacific Coordinator Kurt Campbell co-hosting the session on Tuesday. On to Russia as the country halted participation in the year-old UN broker deal which lets Ukraine export grain through the Black Sea just hours after a blast knocked out Russia's bridge to Crimea in what Moscow called a strike by Ukrainian sea drones. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated uh, regarding Russia's decision to exit the deal, adding that the move would strike a blow to people in need everywhere. While in Washington, the White House said that Russia's suspension of the pact will worsen food security and harm millions. Let's take a look. Russia has suspended participation in the Black Sea deal that allowed Ukraine to export its grains. Moscow announced the move Monday. It came just hours after an alleged attack on the bridge to Crimea, but officials denied there was any connection. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said the West had failed to implement measures intended to facilitate Russian exports. The grain deal has halted. As soon as the Russian part of the deal is fulfilled, the Russian side will resume the fulfillment of this deal without delay. The last ship carrying grain left Ukraine on Sunday. Nearly 33 million tonnes of corn, wheat and other grains had been exported by the country under the deal. 
Now Moscow's move will raise concern over global food supplies and prices. Carlos Mira is head of research for agricultural commodities at Rabobank. He says developing nations look vulnerable. So uh, prices will go up. That will mean more food insecurity at a time when, of course, countries, uh, especially underdeveloped countries, are struggling with debt in many cases. Um, so we will expect food security to become an even more pressing topic in the future. The initial market reaction to the deal's demise was muted. Wheat futures rose around 3%. Traders said there was a view that the EU and other suppliers would be able to satisfy demand. But leaders remain concerned and will hope to revive the agreement. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan said he would discuss it with Vladimir Putin at an expected meeting in August. Erdogan said he believed the Russian leader wanted the pact to continue. Financial relief is not far for students in the UK as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has called for a change in the way some university courses are offered, with a particular focus on what the Prime Minister described as a rip-off degrees. Limits are set to be imposed on courses that have high dropout rates or low number of graduates getting into employment. Full of hope for the future, but have some of the students graduating up and down the country today been sold a false dream? Yes, according to the Prime Minister, who wants to see a major shake-up of the university system, imposing a cap on what he calls low-quality degrees. Part of these reforms, clamping down on low-quality courses, will improve the overall financial sustainability of the system. And that's right. It's right for students, right for the taxpayer, and ultimately will build a better education system. In the House of Commons, the Education Secretary was under pressure to say which courses were in the firing line. Data shows that there were 66 providers where fewer than 60% of graduates progress to high-skilled employment or further study 15 months after graduating. This is not acceptable. A government whose only big idea for our world-leading universities is to put up fresh barriers to opportunity, yeah. anxious to keep young people in their place. Beyond Westminster, it's students who will feel the effects of these changes. So what do these Leeds graduates make of it all? If you have a passion and you can study at university, <laughs> each degree should be seen equally. It's both the opportunities that you're given and also how much of those opportunities you're able to make use of. There's no point doing a university degree that you feel as if you're being pushed to do because it looks good and you think you're going to get a job. More details will be revealed over the summer when we'll find out if this political theatre will result in real action. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now Israel has announced it was recognizing Moroccan sovereignty uh, over Western Sahara, joining the United States as the only countries to acknowledge the kingdom's annexation of the disputed North African territory. It's the latest step in the normalization of relations between Morocco and Israel. On Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sent a letter to the King of Morocco, assuring the latter of Tel Aviv's willingness to recognize Morocco's sovereignty over the disputed Western Sahara region. This measure will consolidate relations between the countries and the peoples and the pursuit of cooperation to strengthen regional peace and stability. Tel Aviv and Rabat re-established diplomatic relations as part of the Abraham Accords in 2020, brokered by former President Donald Trump between Israel and the Arab states. In exchange for Morocco normalizing relations with Israel, the Trump administration promised to recognize Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. With this latest decision, Israel joins the United States as the only two nations who recognize Rabat's authority over the region, while Spain gave its support over Rabat's plan for governing Western Sahara in 2022. The Western Sahara dispute dates back to 1975, when colonial ruler Spain withdrew from the territory. This sparked a 15-year war between Morocco and the Polisario Front movement, backed by Algeria. Rabat controls nearly 80% of Western Sahara and sees the entire region, home to abundant phosphates and fisheries, as its sovereign territory and advocates for limited autonomy. On the other hand, the Polisario movement wants the territory to become independent and has called for a UN-supervised referendum on self-determination. 
In 1991, the UN brokered a ceasefire between the two factions and established a peacekeeping mission to monitor the truce and help prepare a referendum on the territory's future. However, the vote never happened due to disagreements over who was eligible to cast a ballot, and the Polisario Front renewed armed conflict in 2020, ending a 29-year truce, while Algeria broke diplomatic ties with Rabat. We have some good news for you. There is hope on the horizon as data confirms that an experimental Alzheimer's drug made by Eli Lilly slowed cognitive decline in early stage patients, putting it on course to be the second treatment approved within months that alters the cause of the disease. An experimental Alzheimer's drug from Eli Lilly has shown to significantly slow the progression from the brain wasting and deadly disease. That's according to researchers on Monday who said the treatment can slow progression of the illness by about a third, but that rate doubles to 60% if the drug is taken when patients are only mildly impaired. New trial data for the drug donanumab showed less robust results for older, later-stage patients, as well as those with higher levels of a protein called tau. The president of neuroscience at Eli Lilly said the findings underscore that, quote, Earlier detection and diagnosis can really change the trajectory of this disease. Here, we see a healthy brain shrinking to an Alzheimer's brain. The results of Eli Lilly's study, which involved more than 1,700 patients, were presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in Amsterdam. But the study also showed that the drug carries risks. Brain swelling, a known side effect, occurred in more than 40% of patients with a genetic predisposition to develop Alzheimer's. The company had previously reported that 24% of the overall donanumab treatment group had brain swelling. Brain bleeding occurred in 31% of the donanumab group and about 14% of the placebo group. And researchers said the deaths of three trial patients were linked to the treatment. But the clinical success of donanumab would be a game changer. More than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's, according to the Alzheimer's Association. Eli Lilly expects the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to decide by the end of this year whether to approve donanumab. Now in some tech sphere updates, Twitter's cash flow remains negative because of a nearly 50% drop in advertising revenue and a heavy debt load. Elon Musk said falling short of his expectation in March that Twitter could reach cash flow positive. More woes for Twitter as owner Elon Musk says the company has lost half of its ad revenue. That, combined with a heavy debt load, mean Twitter's cash flow remains negative. Musk bought the social media platform for $44 billion in October and proceeded to go on a cost-cutting spree, laying off thousands of employees and cutting cloud service bills. Musk said back in March he expected Twitter to reach cash flow positive by June. But on Sunday, he acknowledged that hadn't happened, adding that, quote, July is a bit more promising. It is unclear what time frame Musk was referring to by the 50% drop in ad revenue. But since he took over, Twitter has been criticised for lax content moderation, leading to an exodus of many advertisers who did not want their ads appearing next to inappropriate content. Musk's hiring of Linda Yaccarino, the former head of advertising at NBC Universal, signalled that ad sales remain a priority for the site. Yaccarino started work as CEO in early June and has told investors the site plans to focus on video, creator and commerce partnerships. It is said to be in early talks with political and entertainment figures, payment services and news and media publishers. Since the electric vehicle market is experiencing a price fall, Ford Motors has announced a price cut for its electric F-150 Lightning truck. The car maker wants to gain more of the uh, market share that Tesla currently occupies. With traditional automakers struggling to match Tesla's rate of innovation, Ford has decided to lower prices on its F-150 Lightning pickups. Ford has ramped up its price war with Tesla, slashing the cost of its F-150 electric lightning pickup truck by up to 17% on some models. By doing so, the Detroit automaker hopes to increase its share of an electric vehicle market dominated by Tesla. 
The move comes just two days after Tesla announced it had built the first production version of its long-delayed Cybertruck at its assembly plant in Austin. Tesla had kicked off the price war months ago, leaving EVs of legacy automakers piling up at dealers as sales slowed. In the quarter through June, Ford's EV sales fell 2.8 percent. Tesla, meanwhile, reported a surge in second quarter deliveries. Ford, which had raised Lightning prices earlier this year, said it was now able to lower them due to improvements in scale and declining costs of cobalt and lithium, key materials used to make batteries. It also plans to triple Lightning production to 150,000 vehicles a year. The price of the base Lightning Pro model will fall nearly 17 percent to just below $50,000, while Ford's extended-range high-end Platinum model will drop about 6.2 percent to roughly $92,000. All other models will now start below $80,000, the maximum price eligible for a $7,500 consumer EV tax credit. Ford shares were down 5 percent in Monday trading, Shares of Tesla rose more than 2 percent. Welcome back to World News. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Upon arrival to the stage to make a speech, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was booed during the opening weekend of the 2023 North American Indigenous Games held in Halifax. Swiss police ordered the evacuation of several mountain villages as a forest fire spread in the canton of Alais. The area is affected by the same Mediterranean heat wave affecting the southern Europe, with temperatures set to exceed 30 degrees Celsius in parts of the Alais canton this week. At a UN meeting, a citizens group from Japan's Okinawa prefecture urged its government to conduct investigation over war and soil contamination caused by U.S. military base. Rescue operations were ongoing at inundated alleyways in China's southern Fujian province after a major typhoon struck and caused widespread flooding across the region. State Premier Dan Andrews stated that Australia's state of Victoria will not host the 2026 Commonwealth Games, citing cost overruns. Victoria's withdrawal places the future of the Quadrennial Games under the doubt given the challenge of finding replacement hosts three years out of the event. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight in Shanghai, China, where gourmet meals fill the furry bellies of our favorite animal friends. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.